Well, it's time now for Space Chat. It being Friday afternoon, we talk about all space news with Brad Tucker, astrophysicist, cosmologist at ANU, still in Canberra while I'm up here in uh, Sydney, of course. Brad, let's begin with uh, the Chinese launching essentially another craft to develop an international space station. So this is a rival to the, the main one we always talk about, the ISS. Does, does China just not want to sort of, um, what, be cooperating with other nations, in particular the US? Well, to be fair, it's actually the U.S. doesn't want China to cooperate in the International Space Station. That's exactly right. The, the essentially, International Space Station is an agreement between the U.S. and Russia and other participating countries. Uh, and so they're essentially locked out of because of the, the, the U.S. policies on interacting with Chinese uh, government, essentially, and state operatives. So they don't, aren't allowed to send astronauts and experiments up there. Now, there's also a second part of this, and that is China's obviously, as we've talked a lot about, trying to show they're on equal footing with the U.S. and Russia in terms of space. And the U.S. built their own space station back in the 70s, Sky Lab, so did the Russians with Mir. So China wants to show they can do it alone as well, that they don't need to join an international project, just like the U.S. and Russia, they can do it themselves. And this is another part of what this launch means. It might mean even more space junk. Brad, um, you're alerting us to this problem, and it's all I think about at night now, all that space junk out there, whether satellites will get knocked off. I thought we had the you know, magical laser in Canberra we spoke about recently, and it's pinging it all out of the sky. We are, and there's a lot of this small bits, but the problem is there's just millions of them. And there's also a range in sizes. The laser, as you said, that we've now developed at Mount Stromlo uh, here in Canberra to do this, can do the small things, but not all these large things. In fact, uh, this new map has showed that there's 200 in particular really big pieces of hazardous pieces of space junk. And so what determines their hazardous is how big they are, where they operate, and so their propensity or their likelihood that they will propagate lots of bits when they break apart, which, as you're seeing on the screen, crash into more things and break it apart into more things. So they're in heavily populated space orbits, essentially, big pieces uncontrolled that can produce a lot. And so this is the worry, is that not only do we need to map where they are, but actually solve them as we're trying to do. Because just over the weekend, the SpaceX crew that was heading up actually had to get into emergency protocol because they were worried about a piece of space junk heading for them that would obviously, you know, end in catastrophe. Right. Do, I mean, is this partly a legacy issue? Are we more careful with what we put up there these days? Yeah, look, this is a great question. It, it, a lot of it is legacy. We are a lot better at limiting our space junk. There's a lot of policies and procedures about how to limit it. The problem is it's just still up there. Right? You know, the, the, in fact, the pieces that we were just talking about, a lot of them are old rocket boosters that are from the 60s and 70s that are just littered up in space. So while we are better, we're also still putting more stuff up there. So even if you're better at limiting your junk, we're still sending a lot of it up just because of our volume of how much stuff is going up. So there are multiple issues at play. And so one of the ways is cleaning it up. One of the ways is tracking it to prevent more being created. And the other is ultimately to not create any at all. And so we're trying to do all of these ways to limit this problem. It's like one big clean up Australia Day, basically, and it'll go for a while. Yeah. Hey, just finally, the man, um, look, it feels cruel saying this. He's the man that never quite got on the moon, but he got closer than you or I did. Yeah, Michael Collins, he's, he's kind of the forgotten astronaut or the quiet astronaut people talk. He was the third member of Apollo 11. We obviously know Neil Armstrong, the first to go on the moon, and Buzz Aldrin afterwards. That only worked because Michael Collins was up in the command module orbiting around controlling it. And in fact, at times, he was the loneliest man in the universe because he had Buzz and, and, and Neil on the surface, everyone at Earth, and him orbiting around himself. Uh, he passed away two days ago at the age of 90. And in fact, he was kind of the only one to actually adjust to normalcy. Buzz Aldrin had a lot of issues, including uh, uh, drinking. Neil Armstrong became kind of a recluse. Michael Collins was actually quite proud of his job, even though, as you said, it's like he ran a marathon, except he was told to stop 100 metres short of the finish line <laughs> and watch everyone else finish and then just return to Earth. But he was proud of that job, and he would actually have been faced to make a lot of terrible decisions if something get went wrong uh, on the lunar surface. So he was kind of this vital life link uh, and, you know, a, a, a sad passing into the, the history, essentially, of space travel. Yeah. So a significant figure. So just clarify, I, I feel like I should know this. So he was actually still orbiting while the other two were down on the moon's surface. 
That's right. They actually needed someone to orbit in that command module to A, relay the communications with the safety protocols and actually help control the mission on the ground. So you mm. essentially needed someone to aid the people who are landing. So someone was always destined to stay back. And that man was Michael Collins for the Apollo 11. And I think that this is exactly the point that you're really making well, is that we, we know what they did on the surface. Yeah. But all of that happened because Michael Collins stayed back to allow them to do that on the surface and make it happen from above. Well, good to see I can make good points, even if it's my ignorance. Brad Tucker, we'll talk again next week. Thank you. Thanks, Tom.